introduce myself, I'm the commercial channel manager for Bari. So I manage the relationship between Facebook uh, and South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria and Ghana. And so any new information that comes in as far as education, new types of ad formats, new developments as far as groups or, or anything that happens on the platform, I will then disseminate to, uh, to our team and obviously to everyone here as well as much as we can. I'm joined today with uh, Sabiso Mazbuko, who is national Facebook champion. He touches all the, uh, all the agencies, as much as people as we can in the country. I'm also joined by Garth Broder, who's group sales director at Habari Media. He's, he's my boss. And so it's always <laughs> good to have him in the, in, in the, the room. Um, so thanks a lot, Chris. So let me kick off. And also, Miles as well. Miles Brown is uh, part of our team at Habari Media uh, as far as sales goes. So I wanted to uh, just start off, uh, the last time when I was in the London Facebook office, I met um, quite a number of, of senior global digital people, uh, namely one of them was uh, Debbie Weinstein, which is the global head for Unilever. And she was telling me a lot about how they've actually decided to bring Facebook to the core of their business for R&D. Everything that happens as far as Unilever goes, as far as brand developments, they will source and find out information up on Facebook before releasing and amplifying the message um, through to the customers. Another um, key digital head was the CEO of Edelman, uh, which is quite a big PR firm um, in the UK. And he says whenever he goes and meets clients, he always asks them uh, two simple questions. First of all, as marketers, what you think is the most important um, form of marketing? And what do you guys think being marketers yourselves? Best word, of mouth. word of mouth. So word of mouth. Now, now, what do you think is the best platform for word of mouth marketing? Social network, social media. Because of the social recommendation, the social endorsement that friends give um, when they're recommending products. And uh, even Samsung themselves saw an 18% increase in purchase intent for the new Galaxy Tab in the UK based on social recommendations that friends have made on Facebook. But I really wanted to touch on where Facebook is and where it's going. And it's really been developing from already a, a 2.0 to a 3.0 and really uh, pushing the boundaries as far as um, a social platform can go. And Facebook first started off as a communication between you and your friends and family and it started off uh, what gave brands the ability to come in and communicate. So it was a three-way uh, dimension, three-way dialogue. Now brands have the ability to go in and communicate with other brands. So there's truly this four-way communication dimension that you can't get in anywhere else. And I want to talk to you a bit more about that. I also want to talk to you about how to improve your brand's presence on the homepage where 70% of all activity happens. How can we improve your edge rank, which is um, Facebook's answer to Google pa uh, page rank. And then also I wanted to touch on uh, policy, policy checklist, because I know a lot of you guys are doing fantastic work in Facebook through applications and competitions. But there's a lot of legal um, uh, legalities that need to be approved and checked through Facebook before they, they can be approved to run. And uh, we've had experience in the last few weeks of a lot of pages in South Africa being closed down because we've been running illegal competitions on Facebook. And I want to just go through a one-page PDF, which I brought some to give to you guys as well to keep. And then lastly, I thought it would be good to go through two case studies, um, one in Budweiser and then one uh, car uh, vehicle uh, case study we can share with you. So Facebook's developing, it's really been about how the web's been built around people. It's been changing in how businesses have become more social, including social elements into their business, and how people have become social by design, and how to target the right people at the right place at the right time. So um, in the 90s, it was all about browsing um, and searching for content in the early 2000s. But really in 2010, it's about discovering uh, content uh, through social platforms and delivering content that's relevant to you and your friends. So the latest research that's been uh, released through Comscore from January 2010 to January 2011 is that it's an increase of 52% in social platforms compared to search and even portals, which is a decrease of 21%. That shows that incre including social elements um, into your platform uh, and into your, to your website can increase traffic tremendously. And I wanted to touch on that because there's been a lot of, um, a lot of companies, a lot of uh, platforms that have really leveraged that opportunity. So Farmville is currently on 80 million users worldwide. Cityville is on 100 million users worldwide. But brands see this as a great opportunity to engage with users. So what Green Giant did was they created these real products. 
So if people bought these products in the store, they can get credits they could then use in the virtual world again. Now this is the kind of push into boundaries thinking that we really um, should start be thinking about. And with the launch of the new video, uh, video chat through Facebook chat, that for me is a fantastic opportunity for brands to use and incorporate on a store level. Why not have these uh, um, um, desktops open with Facebook, with Facebook, you can log in and you can talk and video chat to your friends about the products that might be on the shelves on the, in the store. There's some ideas that we can actually start pushing those boundaries. So Amazon and Groupon saw an increase of 50% of the order value just by including social plugins on their sites and social recommendations. Now the real trick was um, Amazon had social recommendation but it wasn't relevant to their friends or family. And so they included social plugins from Facebook, which made it that much more powerful. As well as uh, news content sites, such as New York Times, Twitter, and CNN, they, as soon as they started including social plugins, saw a massive increase in traffic of 42%. Which leads me on to a new development um, that Facebook's really taking on e-commerce, and they've developed their own f-commerce. A lot of the um, brands in South Africa are, are, are trying to get into, into the space. And there is opportunity for, for people to bring in the e-commerce website through the iframe and sell products directly on Facebook. Now, the reason the thinking behind that is that because if you're, you're, if you're in this happy world, in this happy bubble of Facebook, and you're enjoying the time, why try to send someone off of Facebook to purchase products? Why not keep them there, keep them engaged? And, and, and there's actually research that's been, that's been released that there's a higher increase of purchase if someone has the ability to purchase within Facebook than if that have been sent to an external website. So 1-800-Flowers saw 4,000 transactions just by running campaigns within their Facebook tab. Uh, Delta Airlines, I believe there's, there's a few other airlines that have already started offering tickets uh, through Facebook and through the iframe. Uh, Coca-Cola and Max Factor as well. What kind of revenue share? So, um, Brands can, can purchase, or users can purchase uh, credits for around 10 US cents. There's, a, there's opportunity for uh, brands to make uh, a margin on that um, if they get users to use Facebook credits. Facebook will, um, will get a certain percentage of everything that's sold through Facebook credits. But it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to use Facebook credits. You can just use your own currency through e-commerce. So there's the opportunity. But I know that Facebook is working with PayPal uh, and F&B in the market to, to try and launch it. There's a lot more case studies that I've sent to you, but I'll make sure everyone else gets sent it. So currently, there's 750 million users uh, within Facebook, and I believe quite strongly at the beginning of next year, we'll be in a billion users worldwide. Um, you know, the growth in South Africa has been tr quite tremendous. When I first started here over a year ago, um, we were just on 2.1 million users in, in the country. Now we're on 4.25 uh, and probably a little bigger than that, actually. So there has been that massive growth. So 4.2 million users uh, that we can officially say. I also wanted to tell you that um, there's 3.1 million South African users that access Facebook through their mobile as well as PC. And there's only 1.5 that only access through their PC. There's also 330,000 people that check in every week to various places on Facebook <coughs> without a reason to. Um, so that's weekly unique users. Um, you know, I don't know the complete stats for Foursquare or other location-based tracking mobile platforms. 62,000. Um, you know, I'm not sure if we're all accurate, but but. For me, Facebook is completely blowing them out the water. And with the introduction of Facebook deals, which is just being launched now, um, the ability for brands to get, or users to get a deal when they check into a store is fantastic. So these stats are currently just the stats for the South African users. So currently it's six plus hours spent per month on Facebook. Israel has just been named the highest, uh, well, the country that spends the most time on Facebook with around 10, 10.5 hours per person that's on there. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, 21 visits per month and 50% return daily to Facebook. Um, I did a study towards the end of last year and I was comp my directive was to compare reach and frequency versus all other media uh, in the country. So I was comparing the Facebook reach block, which can reach a million South African users in a 24-hour period. That, can, that ad unit can, can reach that one person five times versus your tri-nations, your idols, your 
uh, double phase spreads in Cosmopolitan, Gareth Cliff show, radio shows, uh, Fresh's Drive. And although Facebook wasn't the cheapest, radio just beat us, um, they still didn't have the reach. The cost and reach in Facebook and the time spent in Facebook is unparalleled in the country. And you know, 50% of users in the UK are on Facebook. It is a, considered a serious, serious media channel. Those are the stats um, comparing mobile and online and also 300,000 check-ins to various places. So let's get more into about how we can work with brands and work with you closer um, to, to help um, set objectives for those brands. Often what, what clients say to us is that, you know, we want to be on Facebook, we don't know how to get there. So a very good idea is to set objectives monthly. You know, where, where do you want your brands to be in a year's time? Where do you want them to be in two years' time? Let's set objectives on a monthly basis to get to those fan numbers that you want to, to grow in order to engage with. And Facebook say, if you've got 500,000 fans, which I believe is one or two brands in the country that do, you potentially have the reach of 60 million that can be part of their fan page. So we have an internal tool um, at Abari that can help look at the friends of connections of your brands to see what is the true potential of that brand page. It's really great for setting objectives. I wanted to touch on um, the brand of study. So the brand of study has been now released uh, in South Africa, and it is a study between Nielsen's and Facebook. And what happened was when, when Facebook first started, they had ads that were very much similar to this, where they didn't have any social recommendation or, or endorsement from friends, friends in the ad unit. Later, Facebook developed, and they included their friends' names. And now, furthermore, there's going to be, instead of these friends' names, there's going to be faces of the friends. And they've proven there's a 25% increase in engagement by having someone's face versus their name. But that's later to come. So what Nielsen's did is they, they, they run surveys before the start of a media campaign, and then they run surveys at the end. They start with a, an advertising group, and they select a holdout group to compare the results. Then they send those users a series of different polling ads and questions. So based on the social recommendations that friends have, they've proven there's a 4x increase in purchase intent for their product, 2x increase in message awareness, and a 1.x increase in, in brand recall. Now, Samsung did the very, this very thing, and it, um, it proved that they had 18, 18 points left in purchase intent for the new Galaxy Tab, which is, which is quite remarkable on Facebook. So I just want to quickly run through the methodology with you. So um, what they do is they will select a holder group. They will select um, an advertising group. They'll work with the brand to figure out what kind of questions that the users are most likely going to be able to answer and information they'll want to, to have. Interesting, interestingly enough, um, uh, it, it is being launched in the country, but we're only offering it currently at the moment for Facebook Deals partners. So it is, it is free to any Facebook Deals partners that launches with us in the next few months. Uh, thereafter, there will be um, quite a high price tag to it, but this kind of information that you can get is, is, is something certainly that can prove a return on investment. So these ads will auto automatically displayed to the users. There'll be a holdout group, a test group, and a control group. Um, and the results will be revealed as far as met awareness, message association, likability, or purchase intent for that product. Can I, can I ask a question with respect hmm. to the question? Go for it. Previously, I was thinking, do you have a stat for South African users? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any more details? To, are you able to in any way delve deep into that? So you get a sort of profile of target audience. Yeah, absolutely. We've got. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know you were getting there, but I was waiting to pull it up. But um, yeah, we do have a breakup of ma uh, male, female, um, as well as the age breakup. Um, I would say that a great site to have a look at that is Social Bakers. Uh, it gives you all that breakdown. Also, the Social Bakers. You can go into Social Bakers and you can have a look at all the various countries in Africa or around the world, and it will give up those breakdowns. It will also give you the top five. Uh, pages of the country. Um, I would, what I would say is don't look at CPM rates, CPC rates uh, on there. Um, I would only say for social bakers, look at the user numbers and the demographic breakdown. I am currently trying to find, um, and, if, uh, and if it is all possible, to get an LSM breakdown of Facebook users in South Africa. Do you, it also gives a breakdown. Um, is it 
sort of done it together, but have you I've got a hierarchy of leaders? So people who are really kind of in active, involved, doing stuff, and then other people who are quite irregular. Have you got more information in terms of yeah, no, people are really actively engaged in those mm. I think, no, I, offhand, no, I don't. But I'll have to actually dig deep and ask, ask Facebook to see if they can provide that information. Sometimes for Facebook, it's, it's information we can get quite easily. And then sometimes they're very wary about privacy and stepping on the boundaries of the users. So, but I will, I'll definitely yeah, get it from Chris. Mm. No, well, these figures, the 4.25, are active users. So they're not sitting at, on, at work with the Facebook open and they haven't done anything in the whole day. They're actively engaging on Facebook. So those are active user numbers. Yeah. So at the moment, if I wanted to know how many Facebook users are actually are interested in cards, if they're just cards or how many are interests, mm. that information probably is not available yet. No, you can. You can actually search through the through the through the tool uh, yeah. on marketplace ads. Yeah. You can see how many people are interested in cards. You tell who they are. You can see you can't see individual profiles. No, that will they'll be across your yeah, privacy. Yeah, no, you won't be able to tell you individually. No, no, but what you could do is we have a series of different types of tar um, targeting that we can provide. So, with the reach block that we have, which captures 100% share of voice on the home page, once that ad is finished running, we can pull up the top 10 likes and interests of the users that have engaged with that ad, and then once we know that information, we can do a ser second round or learned targeting which actually helps you grow the fan base and dig deeper into everyone. Oh. So with the Samsung um, Nielsen's brand of study, they actually started off with the reach block. They did uh, sustained media. Uh, another word for sustained media is engagement ads uh, or homepage ads. And they finished off with the reach block, but it had an always on strategy, which is a combination of marketplace ads as well as engagement ads. So there are over 153,000 engagements, uh, awareness up about 9 points, and purchase intent by up to 18 points. I really wanted to touch on um, the, the structure of how Facebook works. And this is going to build into uh, the edge rank and, and the real estate in Facebook, which is the home page. So your bought media is, is all your ad units directing users through to your fan page. And your owned media is that engagement you create yourself on the fan page. But what we found in South Africa that a lot of brands are doing is they are advertising or directing users from radio ads and TV ads to, to, through to the fan page, but they've got no Facebook media within Facebook reminding users to go to their fan page. And there's been massive drop-offs. And I think a lot of brands have missed a trick with that. There needs to be media within Facebook reminding the user with TV and radio as a bolt-on. And then you'll get that organic spread that comes in the form of earned media. So earned media or organic spread is, we found through two campaigns that we've run, actually quite a number of campaigns that we've run, uh, but namely Vodacom um, and Caltrain, is that we ran a campaign using reach blocks and engagement ads for, for a three week or, or a month period. And we gained them about 6,000 fans. But then we gained them an extra 3,000 fans after the end of the campaign based on the organic spread of people still commenting and sharing the information about their brand. So effectively, Caltrain and Vodacom reduced this their CPM, and over the length and time of that campaign, it would have completely paid for itself. You know, you can't get this organic and viral spread in any other platform, and that really is the, you know, the beauty of the homepage media, and you can't get this without being on the homepage. So generating valuable stories, this is a real estate. So we talk about when people check in, um, they will immediately when they check into the store, we'll go into the news feed, we'll go into their profile for all their friends to see. People start seeing that they've checked into places, they're going to create stories. It's going to be on the news feed for their friends to see. So it's going to multiply. A company called Bright, uh, uh, Eventbrite, um, had so started including social plugins on their website. So when people bought tickets, they shared it with their friends. They had 11 referrals uh, per share, and it actually bought them $2.52 uh, $2 worth of business for every referral they had. So that is the power of social sharing. The mentions of the brand can be tracked through the page insights, but it will be all activity on the newsfeed. <coughs> Return on investment through brand lift, through homepage media, can be tracked because of, ho uh, because of homepage ads. 
and purchase intent for products based on events that those brands create results in sales. This is why for us the home page is so important for brands. Because also something else to consider is that when you when you are building strategy for your brand and they're important brands, you don't want them to be against weight loss and hair loss on the profile pages. Um, you want to be them to give them the premium 100% sure voice on the home page. So I just want to quickly chat about edge ranks. So this is the new movement. So I've come really to a point where this is the new direction that Facebook's going in this year. So the new developments that are coming out the next few months are all going to be based around stories. Stories and connections. That is the real key for Facebook at the moment. So edge rank is, is really about how to improve your content in such a way that it gets delivered to your users more frequently. And there's several different things that you can, you can do to actually improve that edge rank, improve that content to, to, those, to those fans. I know this is very content heavy, apologies. But I quickly want to run through, through this with you. So um, key tips that this is what Facebook have given us. So key tips um, is asking questions for new products and services. Um, Buddy Media um, have said through some research that if you have posted 80 characters or less in length, there's a 27% increase in engagement rate. So it's something to consider when you're posting and, and commenting. Create forums, um, create discussions, give the, give the users the opportunity to, to engage in other, other content that might not be specifically relevant to the brand. I mean, I was on Facebook this morning and I saw that uh, Jeep South Africa was commenting about marmalade and how long it's been in the country. You know, it's, it's got nothing to do with the brand, it's got nothing to do with sales, but it's got engagement. People are talking about it, it's something, it's something fun. And I think those are the kind of things that also need to be considered. Vary the material, whether it's videos or posts um, or photos, including samples or coupons if there is opportunity to do that. Um, sharing links. Now, sharing links might be links to the brand or information that people want to find out more about the brand or it could be something completely different. The interesting thing about links is that if you direct users to something that's not related to the brand but it's interesting, when you do create something about the brand, there's more likely a chance of them going to those links. And then ask to share, ask users to share uh, using social plugins on the site. Um, latest research that just come out by another company, um, uh, something very similar to Eventbrite, but what they've, uh, they've released a white paper that shows that you can improve your SEO ranking through Facebook um, social plugins. The more time your brand is mentioned um, in, in posts or by the brand or by users, it will increase your position on the natural listings in Google. The more fans you have on your fan page will increase your position in, 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 in Google. So when you're working with search and, and Facebook together, it's, it can work pretty well for the brand. And then post when people are listening. You often find that South African brands don't post from Friday to Sunday. No one's working on those days, but people are still on Facebook. I mean, we've got to consider about the user's experience as well. So that brings me to another opportunity to leverage the homepage, and which is the introduction of sponsored stories. So sponsored stories is really the opportunity to amplify the brand's message massively. There's actually 25% high engagement rate on sponsored stories than there are normal ads on the homepage. And the reason being is that your content that you're having on your, on your newsfeed is constantly coming in from your friends. So the fact that you like VW will only stay above the fold for so long before it drops. But what Sponsor Stories does, it gives brands the opportunity to amplify the message to the premium position on the right-hand side for the entire length of that, of that ad campaign. And there's, there's different, uh, different ways and different Sponsor Stories which I'll go through, but I wanted to quickly pay you a video that can help expand this a little bit more. So, you know, my friend Joe just goes and he checks in the Starbucks. That'll appear on my newsfeed, and I may or may not see it. And what we've seen is that a lot of impressions do get lost because there's so much content coming through. Starbucks has come in and say, I want to promote check in to our location. So when I come to the site, I see the story that my friend checked in at Starbucks. Now I can click through, I can, I can like the Starbucks page from that story. And when I like
like that page, it creates more organic content. These word of mouth recommendations uh, embody uh, many different strategies. So, for example, for restaurants, they can use check-ins, or if they have an application, can do a user-published application stories. Anything that one of your friends is seeing as a sponsored story, which features some of your content, is actually something they would have already seen in the newsfeed. A sponsored story never goes to somebody who's not one of your friends. It's not this message that's saying, you know, you should buy this thing or you should come to this website. It's your friend saying, look, I did this. In our pilot cases, sponsored stories really increased a brand lift, especially ad recall and the likeliness to recommend to a friend. So we're very excited about this model. We wanted to give a way for application developers, page owners, place owners to be able to promote their content that's as core to the user experience as newsfeed. Um, I think with sponsored stories, it, it, we created that. Great, so there's, there's several different types of sponsored stories that, that brands can use. If someone likes your, your brand or uses an application, the fact that they've used it, they've used that will be amplified to their homepage for all their friends to see. People can check into various store locations or even um, uh, comment on a, on a post that the brand's made that will also be amplified to the homepage. If application or games used, and my, my personal favorite is the domain sponsored story. So if you have social plugins on your website and a user likes a piece of content on that website, it will automatically be amplified to the homepage of Facebook. Sorry, and if you actually like check in and have like a horrible experience, like worst burger at McDonald's, does that automatically just feed you or do they filter that out? They filter it out. So okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was my first reaction because my, my, my first uh, objection to that was what about negative sentiment? And Facebook came back with their, their algorithm picks up anything negative that's, that's possibly said about the brand, so they won't amplify that to the home page. It yeah? obviously creates a scenario that if you get these like friend junkies who've got 5,900 friends or something like that, they actually become fairly influential uh, potential um, uh, media channels themselves. So mm. in other words, brands could start using those people, could start employing those people to give paid recommendations. Yeah, well. be able to discriminate between no, well, I mean, look, Gareth Cliff's doing it now. I think he's selling his tweets or something ridiculous. So yeah, it's got its social media ratio. Absolutely ridiculous, yeah. But if that's apparently what they're doing in the U can't US. Stop that from happening. So, the, the, so the, the, the integrity of a personal recommendation may be eroded over time. Mm. And brands realize that that's just another channel. Well, it's celebrity endorsement. Yeah. I mean, there is most likely going to be a lot more people liking it if I know someone yeah. popular is, is, is endorsing it. But as far as, well, but I don't know how, yeah. just one of my friends, it's, it's also a more honest recommendation. Exactly, so, yeah. So what I'm saying is, how do I know that one of my friends is going to be encouraged to do it or paid to do it, to do it yeah. But that will obviously, gonna, that'll obviously start happening, or it's probably happening already. Depends on the brand, yeah. how much money they have to ask, yeah. you know, as many people to do that, you know, but it could be interesting, yeah. So I just want to quickly touch on this. I know a lot of you have, have seen this already, but um, just a quick touch. These are standard homepage ads, which are ads that direct users off of Facebook to another external website. These are homepage engagement ads that provide those organic impressions that you can get from, the, from, from campaigns. Your video ads are the ads that create videos that capture 100% uh, share of voice when the user is watching the video, blacks out the rest of the screen. Your poll ads and event ads are the best performing ads. So if you ever run campaigns for your brands, try and include these ad formats because they have a much higher engagement rate. People love to vote, <coughs> people love to RSVP. Strange enough, but they do. Standard like ads increase fan numbers and also have the organic um, uh, impressions as well as social recommendation. And the new ad that's just come out is the application ad, which actually takes users directly to an application that you've created for the brand. Now, Quite interesting enough, if you actually have an application ad as well as application sponsor story, I think your your, your message is going to be spread massively. So that gets us to just a quick uh, some case studies. I know uh, I wanted to talk to you guys about Budweiser because you do a lot of work with with SAB, and 
Acer, uh, and Budweiser uh, was a World Cup uh, football sponsor, and they decided to create this fantastic application that allowed users to change their face or paint their face virtually to support whichever team uh, they, was, they were supporting throughout the World Cup. And I mean, it was really, it's, it was really a start for Budweiser to get into the social space. They ran a series of different engagement ads as well as, as, well as um, reach blocks throughout the campaign. Um, and the result for me is really staggering. I mean, they had 2.7 people paint their face through this application. They had 900,000 people like the brand because of this application. And they had six people like in every minute. I mean, fantastic opportunity for, for us locally to look and, and learn. Um, but yeah, what brilliant. What cost of something like that for you? I mean, I don't know what the cost of the application was, but the ad units in the States are $50,000 minimum spend. Reach Reach Rock's probably $80,000. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, so I, I mean, also, I mean, Levi's um, was also a fantastic case study. Um, they worked, uh, well, they also did a campaign very much similar to what Sephora did. Um, Levi's, interesting enough, are, are a really great example of the social plugins on a website. So if you have a look at their website, you'll see every kind of social plugins that there is is on their website to share with their friends. They ran uh, a series of campaigns of engagement ads as well as marketplace ads. They increased traffic to the Levi's store by 35%. They actually had 1,600 people walk through the doors based on event ads on Facebook. They, this, for me, is the only, has been the really the true point where we can measure direct sales based on Facebook advertising. And there is a video but I don't know if we included it in this one, if, t if we took it out. On the memory stick. Do we have time for a quick little video? Okay, but I'll, we'll I'll, show you the, I'll show you the video, because the video for me is really interesting, but we'll quickly show it to you after Sapiso's case study. Uh, here you go. Sorry, there you go.
but that some of the ads linked directly to their website, where you could actually then upload test drives. So they were able to link the number of test drives that they had directly from the campaign as well. So all of those different things can be can become directly measurable if they are all planned and mapped out properly. Hmm. There's also um, some some case studies that we haven't been able to share officially. Uh, for some liquor brands that we've run uh, in South Africa and in Africa, we've had experiences. We've had click-through rates of 2.0 for for some of those campaigns. So, low click-through rates uh, is something that we can really overcome on Facebook. Can I just ask you? Yeah. That's how many times I've actually seen it. So every time a page gets in, um, gets refreshed, that's going to be one impression. Um, your feedback is going to be because you'll see your impressions and feedback. Yeah. So feedback will it's tell you how many people have actually. Yeah. So generally, you'll see your point point whatever percentage feedback you've had, and that'll tell you how many people have actually clicked or engaged with that piece of content. <laughs> impressions are just how many people have actually seen it, or how many yeah how many times it's been seen. Not necessarily how many people have seen it, but how many times it's been seen. I wanted to get onto some of the promotional policies now, uh, but I know we, can we go for it? Okay, brilliant. <laughs> sorry. Oh, and sorry, just, um, you, asking, you, uh, you also asked the question about how much it costs to run a reach block. Um, and I know we spoke about the United States and South Africa to run a reach block, it's $12,000. Um, which translates at current exchange rates to about 78,000 Rand, plus minus there. That basically, like Mike was talking about, it gives you 100% share of voice over a 24 hour period. So, um, so potentially reaching about 1.1 million unique users over that 24 hour period when you're running a campaign. Cool. So, feel free to jump in when you want, Saviso. But, um, <laughs> thanks. Um, really, for me, it's been a, a lot of. Uh, a lot of challenges in the South African market and you know Facebook to be honest hasn't made it very easy for brands to create applications and share them and talk about competitions it's, it really it really is in some cases a very difficult um, situation but this uh, checklist is something uh, I've got a few that I'll hand out to everybody but um, I think for me the, the, there's three main things that if a brand does it's you have a much better chance of that application being approved so disclaimers on your application. You need to have disclaimers of the actual competition if you're running a competition. You need to have terms and conditions uh, as well as on the application as well if it's to do with competitions. And you also cannot mention anything about a competition or entry to competition or the mechanics of a competition on the wall of Facebook. The wall of Facebook is considered Facebook's property. So if the brand doesn't uh, fulfill in its promise to that user, Facebook is held liable. That's why all competitions and applications are third party, which is on the tabs. So the tabs are considered third party. Anything happens there, it's not held back to you or, or related back to Facebook. So, so we start off with just the privacy applications include its privacy policy around the developer's application. Um, as well as a privacy policy on its Canvas page or website. We'll probably get into this a bit later, but when, if any of you are involved in creating applications, having pre-filled boxes for people to share amongst friends is also illegal. It needs to be blank for users to enable to comment or put their own comments into it before it gets shared. Um, in, the, in the past, it was, uh, Facebook had the opportunity to share an application or a competition to as many friends as they want. Now it's been limited to only one or two, I believe. Um, I don't know if you know. But um, there is a no way around that. So if you are in involved in application development, you can actually rather send requests. Because if you send a request out, so you can send as many, as many requests to, to as many friends as you want. But you cannot share the fact that you've used that application or competition. So applications provide custom support for users but make it easy for users to contact them. So you need to have contact information. Application does not include data it has received from Facebook concerning user in any advertising creative. So once again, they relate to Facebook's privacy policy. 
Um, application advertisements do not include any platform integrations, including social plugins, such as the like button. That, for me, is also very important. There's been a lot of applications um, that have included the social plugins in the application, but you can't do that. You can't have a like uh, a certain um, comment or, 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 or create a social plugin within the application. Also, what we found is you can rather have that at the bottom of the application so people can comment on the fact that they've used that application, but not inside it. Just one thing as well, because you'll be working with a lot of brands and creating these applications, we have a tool called the, an application shielder. So if you send, uh, or send it to us or Safiso, uh, which probably we'll be seeing you on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis, if you send them that application ID, we can shield that application from being closed down. So just a really helpful tool. Mm -hmm. So, like, for example, after I've played in my phone, you know, the app, so the, the previous section, it means that you can't tell them, like, this is awesome already on my behalf, and then when... Yeah, I, I, I can't, as Budweiser, say that this is awesome on your behalf, no. Okay, and then, like, for example, like, where would the like, the like button apply within that app? Like, so while I'm still facing my own phone, so I have, like, a like button there that I can't click on it. So when they talk about the social plugins, there won't be, during the process flow that you're involved in allowing them to access your information and actually select, a, say, select a flag, there isn't a social plugin like a like button or a recommend button in that application. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what they're saying. You can have your own. Right at the very end, I can do that. Like when I return into my news feed. No. Not at the very end either. It rather rather keep social plugins out. What you could do is create your own like button or your own like or um, um, button within it. So you will still like the, that product, but it can't be the social plugins from Facebook. Okay. Or well, like my friends can like the fact that I have actually played in my phone, so it pops up in my newsfeed. Yeah, that's fine because they'll be on that's on Facebook. So that's yeah, that's anyway, own yeah. Facebook stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's the social channels. Yeah. Uh, where was it now? Um, application advertisements do not include any platform. Okay, so, so if the application includes alcohol-related content, it uses appropriate Facebook demographic restrictions. So that's fine. So just on that as well, all alcohol, gambling, tobacco has been lifted on Facebook. So you can advertise those brands if it abides by the country's laws. So maybe you are working with Marlboro in Kenya. If, they, if it's legal there, you can advertise on Facebook there. Application does not promote say gambling, so this is um, that's that's no longer applicable here. So application does not include advertisement across promote other applications. So you can't have advertising in your in your application, um, such as banners or anything like that. Facebook won't allow that. They'll just close the application down or even your page. Um, what you can do. And what we find that's been working really, really well is that you, if you have a collaboration between two brands, say Musica and MTV, you can have um, M Musica applications on the MTV page. And that's something that I don't think a lot of brands have been thinking about in South Africa, is, is tying up those two brands. Because for me, MTV has got such a massive uh, user base of 500,000 users. If there's something about Musica on that page, there's more chance of those users going to the Musica page and engaging with Musica. Application only uses a feed form, which uses, uh, gives the user the option to review and customize their post. So just on that, um, if you have an application um, that, that requires people to fill out their personal details, there also needs to be terms and conditions disclaimers on that um, in order for it to be approved. Application does not automatically post stream stories on a user's behalf and instead obtains user's consent by providing users with an option to click a button or check a box. So you need to, the user needs to be able to post that content themselves onto the newsfeed. It won't automatically happen from, from the application. And, and does Facebook need to actually approve your CDNC plan or? No. So if I approve my CDNC, I will use your email address and send you a weekly newsletter for the next year. Like that's your T's and C's, but Facebook has no control over that. No, that's your T's and C's. I mean, they'll we'll probably look at it and they'll also look at the landing page, eh? 
Yeah. They'll look at the landing page of, of, of your competition, where it's directed to or another external site. If they don't feel that it's, it's promising what, what the application is promising, they'll disapprove it. But also, you have to have your disclaimer. And in the disclaimer, it says that this application or competition has got nothing to do with Facebook and anything that happens in here, Facebook's oh, okay. not held liable. I think the whole thing about it is as long as as long as every Facebook user knows exactly what they're getting themselves themselves into. Obviously, if it meets with Facebook's promotional guidelines, but that's really the whole thinking is that um, number one, when you're creating applications and creating competitions, when people share the content, it must be people actually sharing it because they think it's really cool, fantastic content, and not because the brand is pushing the content. Um, it needs to be socially relevant to me and my friends. So the challenge for brands is that you got to create some really fantastic content that people want to share. And that's when you start seeing the power of you know, the social recommendation that Mike is talking about. And with regards to the logistics of competitions, as long as there's full disclosure of you know, everything that a person is going to be getting themselves into in terms of entering a competition, those are really the most important things. Applications does not provide users the option to publish a stream story to more than one friend wall at a time. So that, that's what I was talking about earlier. Instead of yeah. publishing to only one person at a time, rather send requests to as many people to get them to, to use the application. And then just last two, application, application does not use Facebook's trademark or express or imply any affiliation with or endorsement by Facebook. So that will be covered by the uh, disclaimer. But also, you can't use Facebook's logos inside the application. Uh, the application does not contain uh, c concepts or features undermine the Facebook product. So, um, a use of the logo in other forms or, or manipulate it in any way. Great. So that comes to the end of, of our first education session. I think there's. I'm hoping there's going to be a lot more. Uh, <laughs> I don't bore you very too much. Quick The full name. Logo. Yeah, so for the full name on, on TV, is, 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 it's been disapproved. So if you're going to be using Facebook in television, it needs to be the F logo and then find us on Facebook. Um, I know there's been a, a number of brands that haven't been doing correctly. Um, and what Facebook is, is, is has started, their, their pages team in the UK office go, go and they look at different applications. They, they obviously have people uh, on the ground that look at um, different applications are not followed and they actually simply just close the pages down. They normally send a warning of uh, around 24 hours beforehand um, and then they normally just close them down. They're also becoming more strict on the use of their logos through TV. Um, obviously, radio doesn't apply, but um, they have uh, Alex Wu, who's, who's head of, of, of the copyright infringement team in the UK office, does that on a regular basis. But as I said, as I said to Chris, if you are going to be running uh, campaigns, it would be easy if you um, just go through the brand permissions form. There's a, a very simple form that you fill out. You can explain what you're going to be using the ad for, what TV uh, station or what program. Maybe just a copy of the logo through a PDF or, or Word document. But once you send it off, there will be a, a reply from Facebook with a reference number. You send that to me and I'll follow up with that and make sure that it gets to you guys as quickly as possible so you can get the sign off within a day or two days. And then it's done. It's rather be better than that than having to uh, Facebook get involved in any way. I don't know if you want to play the video. It's like two minutes. I just wanted to show you this, this video for Levi's and Sephora. For me, it, it, it really is amazing how, how they leverage the platform. Doing things on Facebook is very natural. We're not.
about in the stores day to day, hearing what they're saying. But now Facebook almost takes it to another level. Not only can we hear what they're saying, but we hear it real time. We really get very raw reactions from our customers, whether it's good or bad, and we love that kind of feedback. You pay very special attention to our Facebook community. It is perhaps one of the most immediate forms of feedback that we have. We feel like this is a critical component to engaging and fostering a relationship with our consumers. We find these people incredibly valuable to us. They are not just our brand advocates, but they're also our evangelists. We have such a passionate, authentic, genuine community that are really engaged in what others are saying. It gives us this great opportunity to understand our consumers and to engage with our consumers in a two-way dialogue. There's a connection that all of these fans have formed with each other around Sephora, and so there have been some amazing things that have emerged as a result of that community. We at Mars were incredibly happy and satisfied with the launch of M&M's Pretzel on Facebook. And it created tremendous buzz and chat around how great the product was, where do I get it? Well, I can't think of too many more efficient ways to do that. Levi's used the RSVP ad in order to really drive in-store traffic. The reason we used it is because we wanted to track the viral nature of what was happening. There was a four times viral lift in terms of what we were able to do with our ad spend and then what results we saw in foot traffic to the store. Targeting's been really good for us for a couple of reasons. One is when we're doing something regionally, so if we have actual store opening in an area, we're able to target demographically by where people live. We have certainly a target customer who is a woman, age 25 to 45, and so we're able to target that shopper. We had an integrated campaign centered on our core concept of become a fan, help a dog, which we communicated across a wide variety of media channels, including advertising on Facebook. And through those efforts, we were able to actually grow our connections from just 55,000 to over a million fans within our Facebook page in less than six months. Incredibly powerful campaign that really reached a lot of consumers and helped us to donate over a million bowls of food to shelter dogs in need. I think the numbers continue month over month to amaze us both the organic growth of our fan base and the use of like on Sephora.com and the number of people that are engaging with that and the sales that this is driving. We saw that for a minimal investment, we drove significant traffic, which did translate into sales into our stores. The reason we chose to sort of take a more viral approach to sampling with Facebook and the M&M's pretzel launch was because of the authenticity of each one tell one, as opposed to Mars always pushing the product ourselves. We think it's incredibly powerful for consumers to speak to each other. As other forms of marketing over time decline in terms of their use rate and their open rate and all of those other things, we really look to Facebook as a way to offset that ability to communicate with our clients and a way to reach out to them in a very real, very genuine, fun, exciting, engaging way. We are building strong, long-lasting, and authentic relationships with our consumers. So yes, we continue to advertise in other media, but really this relationship and this conversation that we have started with our consumers will continue for a very long time. It feeds us, it gives us information, and it allows us to talk directly from most important consumers. Cool, yeah, so thanks very much guys. I just want to say thanks again for giving us the opportunity to come present to you. Um, I really do feel that um, you know, it's, it's, our, it's our job, uh, working closely with Facebook, to give you as much information and get, educate you as much as we can. And um, yeah, and I hope we can actually have a few more of these sessions because Facebook is always changing, there's always something different, so there's always something to talk about. So thanks. <laughs>